Hi, in this segment, we are going to deal with the Trinity, which is one of the most sacred, central mysteries of our faith. And so it's a, a real delight and honor for me to be able to tackle this subject. And I'd like to pray. Father, I do believe in the Holy Spirit and pray that he might anoint me now as we speak of this holy ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. The Trinity. Wow. It's interesting that we spoke about the incomprehensibility of God in our last segment because there's no topic that has at its heart an element of incomprehensibility than that of the Trinity. Obviously, there's much that we know about the Trinity, but bottom line, the Trinity is a mystery, and a wonderful mystery at that. Um, some people don't see it that way, though. There have been a bunch of people who have basically said, I cannot believe in Christianity because at the very heart of it is a belief in a God who's contradictory. It's kind of like believing one plus one plus one equals to one. And my response to that is, uh, you've got a misunderstanding of what uh, we're saying. I, uh, I had the privilege to not only study in logic, but of teaching it to middle schoolers. And so I have a pretty good understanding of what constitutes a uh, bona fide contradiction or violation of the law of non-contradiction, which is the basic rule of logic, which states that A cannot be non-A at the same time in the same relationship. Um, so when we assert that God is one in essence and three in persons, that is not a logical contradiction according to the canons of formal logic. Now, if we said that God was one in essence and three in essence, that would indeed be a violation of the law of non-contradiction. But that's not what we say. Um, so, it's important that we see that there's a distinction between a contradiction and a mystery. Um, there was a liberal theologian who said that logical consistency was the hobgoblin of little minds. I don't think so, because the word for truth, emmet, in, or one of them for, in the Old Testament, and aletheia in uh, Greek, both of them contain the notion of logical consistency, logical consistency, as well as correspondence to the truth. And God is a God of truth. And it's one thing to say that the Trinity is a mystery above, way above reason, you know, incomprehensible. But in one sense, but it's another thing to say it's a contradiction, um, which would something that we should. Uh, you know, reject because there's no glory in affirming contradictions. Um, God is a God of truth, as I said. So, having said that, let's jump into the Trinity. And I, just as I was about to, to start, I realized that the notes in the ESV Bible parallel just about what I was going to say. So I'm going to give credit where credit is due. I'm, I'm going to be reading some out of the ESV Bible notes as well as my own notes as well. Okay. Alrighty. The biblical teaching on the Trinity embodies four essential affirmations. Number one, there is one and only one true and living God. Two, this one God eternally exists in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three, these three persons are completely equal in attributes, each with the same divine nature. Four, 
While each person is fully and completely God, the persons are not identical. The differences among the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are found in the way they relate to one another and the role each plays in the accomplishing of their unified purpose, particularly in redemption. You know, there's nothing more fundamental to biblical theology than monotheism. And when we talk about the Trinity or the triunity of God, uh, it's appropriate to, to talk about the unity first, the uh, the monotheistic aspect of God, that there is only one God, and then talk about the uh, plurality of persons um, second. So in affirming monotheism, we go back to the basics of Old Testament belief in the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And this is affirmed over and over and over and over again throughout the Pentateuch. And then the um, prophets just hammered again and again and again. This, the one true God. Worship him and him alone. Now, um, in talking about monotheism, I think it might be helpful to take just a moment to um, speak of my experience uh, in college that uh, may mirror your experience. Because I was taught that, um, well, basically, um, scholars in different disciplines took the notion of evolution and, uh, and applied it to, to their respective disciplines. So that was applied even to the history of religion. So when we're talking about monotheism, I was taught in college that um, early man, way back when in antiquity, that the religion that mankind started with, primitive man, was animism, and that eventually evolved into polytheism, many gods. You know, think, think of ancient Greece um, and their various gods for this, that, and the other. That eventually evolved into henotheism. Not sure if you heard of that or not, but that's the belief that each nation has their own god. You had um, the god of Yahweh for the Israelites, Baal or Baal for the Canaanites, and Dagon for the, the other people, uh, people, excuse me, and uh, so forth. And the, um, then that evolved into uh, monotheism, maybe in the 7th century uh, B.C., somewhere around there. And, of course, the truth, the truth is, is that in the Garden of Eden, God taught the true religion of monotheism, but very soon after the fall, instead of there being an evolution of religion, there, there was a devolution or de-evolution downwards, spiraling down, not only morally, but spiritually regarding beliefs. So instead of going upwards, evolving, went downwards as far as what there was in original monotheism, which... Um, degenerated into animism and the other religions. That's the true picture of what happened. So again, at the heart of the Judeo-Christian religion is the affirmation that there is one and only one true God and all the other gods are false gods. 
non-existent and or animated by demonic powers. And because there is only one God, idolatry of any kind is evil, foolish, wrong, and harmful. Worship of other gods robs the true God of the devotion and glory he alone deserves. Idolatry is not just, you know, of metal things like when Aaron came to Aaron building a calf golden calf while Moses delayed it up in the mountain uh, on a mountain it can be uh, mental as well as metal anything in our mind that's uh, our dominant life value that's other than God <coughs> uh, that can be an idol and it could be money it can be our family it can be any good thing that's elevated to um, a place where it shouldn't be and that's uh, first in our affections so, all right, now, uh, it's in the New Testament, obviously, where the um, image of the Trinity is most clearly revealed, but it doesn't start, it doesn't start there, it starts in, in the Old Testament. I love this image that B.B. Warfield gives. He speaks of how we should view um, things uh, like the Trinity and salvation by faith, <laughs> which were taught in the Old Testament. Try to, try to picture a room full of furniture, but it's very dimly lit. That was the Old Testament. Then when you come to the New Testament, you turn on a very bright light, and you can see all the furniture very clearly. It's not that the furniture wasn't there before, but it's just that you can see it more clearly. <clears throat> so, using that analogy, you can see the outlines of the um, chair and the um, couch of the Trinity and salvation by faith alone and heaven and hell and so forth in the Old Testament. You can see the outlines of them uh, kind of uh, dimly. Uh, but when we come to the New Testament, the lights are turned on um, brilliantly with uh, the person of Christ. So what that is uh, called in theology is progressive revelation, where God progressively from Genesis to Revelation reveals more and more and more of, of himself as time goes by. And with each covenant, when we talk about that, he doesn't X out the other covenants, but each covenant assumes the prior covenant and builds upon it and when we come to the new covenant it doesn't x out you know when god gives us progressive revelation it's not that he's correcting any mistakes he's not he proceeds in a non-contradictory fashion in the unified fashion to reveal more and more and more of himself similarly you know to like in a human relationship which develops um, you don't get to know someone overnight <laughs> um, they um, reveal progressively more about themselves. And the more you get to know about them, the more deeply you get to know them personally. And so we see that progressive revelation going on in the Old Testament. But we do have clear indicators of the Trinity in the Old Testament. In just the second verse of Genesis, we have the spirit hovering over the water later in uh, chapter 1 verse 26 you know, let us make man in our image and i highly doubt that um, god is going to be talking to the angelic council uh, uh, about making man in our image um, no yeah that to me is is trinitarian in nature. We can see um, hints of the Trinity in the angel of the Lord, the mysterious um, son of man in Daniel 7. Um, the most, do you know what the most often Old Testament quote, um, most <laughs> the most often quoted 
Old Testament passage is in the New Testament. It's Psalm 110. It's, um, let's see if we go like this. That uh, I've got that right. The Lord says to my Lord, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your foot, footstool. Okay, it says, O Yahweh, my Adonai, and this is David speaking, and then Christ applies that to himself in the book of, uh, of Matthew. And uh, so, uh, there are there are plenty of hints of the plurality of God in the Old Testament, but obviously when we get to the New Testament, the light is turned on very clearly, and so um, it's all the, when it comes to the Trinity, I think of the baptism where you have <clears throat> Christ in the water, the uh, Holy Spirit is coming down in the form of a dove, <clears throat> and the, the Father speaking verbally to the Son. And so we have, um, at the beginning of um, Jesus' public ministry, as the Holy Spirit is descending from the Father, and the Father declaring from heaven, this is my beloved, <clears throat> this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. <clears throat> so you have all three persons of the Trinity who are present and each one is doing something different. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the um, New Testament authors employ a Trinitarian cadence as they write about the work of God. You got prayers of blessing and descriptions of gifts within the body, which are Trinitarian in nature. And I know that when I was a pastor, and um, probably your, your pastor too, uses this benediction, which is Trinitarian. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. And some other... Trinitarian language would be, of course, the baptismal formula in Matthew 28, baptizing them in or into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And there's many other passages that reveal the Trinitarian or at least plural nature of God. John 14, 16, verse 26, chapter 16, 13 through 15. Romans 8, 9, 15, 16, 2 Corinthians 1, 21 through 22, Galatians 4, 4 through 6, 1 Peter 1, 1 through 2, Jude 20, 21, list goes on and on. Um, there are differences in roles, though the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are equal in dignity and in the divinity. There is uh, a, a distinction of roles, particularly with reference to redemption. And what we have is it seems that there's a uniform pattern in Scripture that the Father plans, directs, and sends. So we have in John 3.16, for, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only or only begotten Son. So we have the Father who is the, the, the planner and the sender. We have the Son who is the one who then uh, is sent and accomplishes redemption. It's not the Father and it's not the Spirit who die for our sins. It's the Son. And then we have the Holy Spirit who takes that accomplished redemption and applies it to God's elect, his people, and indwells his people and sanctifies them. So you have the Father sending the Son, the Son dying for our sins and accomplishing redemption, and then the Holy Spirit applying 
that redemption. So it is uh, definitely God's sovereign grace displayed through a Trinitarian mode of redemption, um, both accomplished and applied to us. Uh, okay. And there is um, historically, I pause there for a second. I was trying to think of, of um, I wanted to mention first the the um, creed that came in 325, the Nicene Creed, and that's a Trinitarian creed. And because it's it's in the crucible of controversy, controversy in the uh, second, third, and fourth centuries of and fifth centuries, uh, because you got Cal Chalcedon in 451, that forced the church to clarify doctrine. And there's nothing like the fires of the cauldrons of controversy and that crucible to. Uh, you know, force people to think through very, very clearly uh, how to define the truth and the, the boundaries of, of of how to express it in an orthodox fashion. And uh, so, within God, there is both unity and diversity, unity without uniformity, and diversity without division. The early church saw this Trinitarian balance clearly, and uh, we have what is known as the Athanasian Creed, uh, about 500 A.D. Quote, we worship one God in the Trinity, and the Trinity in unity. We distinguish among the persons, but we do not divide the substance. The entire three persons are co-eternal and co-equal with one another, so that we worship complete unity in Trinity and Trinity in unity. I'm not sure if you ever heard of that particular creed, but you know this reminds me that those of you who may be students of uh, philosophy may recall that the earliest philosophers were fixated. You know, we're talking about <coughs> before Socrates. Um, were were just um, the they were so focused on on the issue of the one and the many uh, unity and diversity or or to put it this way how to define how to find um, coherence um, for the world that we live in. We live in a world of so much diversity in nature. How can we explain what's the organizing principle for making this diversity, this verse, into a universe so that it's not a, a chaos or a multiverse type thing? You know, so they, they were very much sensitive to that issue and passionate. As I said, he fixated on it. So on the one hand, you had a guy named Parmenides who went to one extreme and said that uh, all is one in trying to explain um, that everything is, is one, there's no motion and so forth. And on the other uh, side of the extreme, uh, other extreme was... Um, Heraclitus, who said everything's changing. Both of them were trying to explain the same phenomena, but they just answered it in opposite ways. And there was just really no way for a pagan philosopher to explain that very profound uh, phenomena. But it's interesting that they tried. And because, again, what they were trying to do was to explain why the universe is a universe because without without the coherence in 
the universe. There's no way to do science. And so they understood that, you know, that, that there has to be some underlying principle to explain all the particulars in life and uh, give them meaning and coherence. So they, uh, what I found, Schaefer helped me on this, was that the, the philosophers down through the ages, in this case dealing with the one and the many, they asked wonderful questions, but they couldn't come up with the answers. But here you had the Bible that comes along and like hand in glove, just beautifully answers that question. The one and the many, you want to know the answer to that question? At the very heart of the being of God himself is one and many, unity and diversity, the Logos, the coherence for the universe. What an astonishing answer. And, and so when I was in college, I was just um, enamored with the ex explanatory power of the Trinity to explain philosophical questions that uh, people kept raising over and over and over again, but could never really find uh, satisfactory answers for but for which the Bible in general, but in particular, the, the, the Trinity uh, could explain. And, you know, while many people were poo-pooing the Trinity as an irrational notion, and um, here I am saying, getting all excited about it because of, of how, I'm not sure I could be a Christian without the Trinity because of how, not just because of his, so much of the explanatory power, but because it, also the fact that there's so much mystery. Um, if we could explain God, we would be God. And with our, since we are finite, we should expect that at the heart of who God is, his being, there should be mystery. And but it's not just mystery. There is, there's a mystery that has incredible explanatory power for the phenomena that we observe and experience on a daily basis. If you just look at nature and you see all the diversity of, you know, looking up at the stars and the sky, but then you see, you notice that, I mean, there is order. All the stars, there's... And um, so that can be applied across the board. And I want to quote from um, the ESV here in reference to this issue. <coughs> this, excuse me, this unity and diversity is at the heart of the great mystery of the Trinity. Unity Without uniformity is baffling to the finite minds, but the world shows different types of reflections of this principle of oneness and distinction at every turn. What is the source of the transcendent beauty in a symphony? The human body, marriage, ecosystems, a church, the human race, a delicious meal, or a perfectly executed fast break in basketball? Is it not in large part due to the distinct parts coming together to form a unified whole leading to a unified result, unity and distinction? The principle at the heart of the Trinity can be seen in much of what makes life so rich and beautiful. Woven into the fabric of the world are multiple reflections of the one who made it with unity and distinctions as the parallel qualities of its existence. Hmm. Wish we had more time to talk about that, but let's spend a moment talking about the historical misunderstandings of the Trinity. You know, a lot of people are uh, not aware of historical theology or church history, and that's unfortunate because um, we'll just repeat the same errors that were done in the past, excuse me, like um, the Arian heresy, but um, it, it helps us to understand um, our brothers and sisters who lived before and that there's a sense in which church history is an extension of the book of Acts, uh, right? We're, we're 
an extension of the book of Acts living in 2018. The work of the Holy Spirit working in his church. One of the most fundamental ways to misunderstand the Trinity is tritheism. Let me back up for a second. There were there basically there were basically two heresies um, that that jumped to the forefront at, at, uh, very quickly, and that was tritheism or tritheism. And you can probably figure out what that means. Tri means three. Theism three. Theism means God. So three gods. Um, so in this particular Heresy overemphasizes the distinct the distinction between the persons of the Trinity and ends up with three gods. This view obviously neglects the oneness of the nature of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, that's tritheism. Now, at the other end of the spectrum of heresies was modal modalism. Now, it can get a lot more complicated than I'm going to explain it, but there's no need for us to, to get into the Neoplatonic Gnostic stuff. Um, a guy named Sibelius, which is why this heresy of modalism is sometimes called Sibelianism, is the notion that God expressed himself in different modes okay so that god expressed himself as father when he created the world and gave the law this god then expressed himself in the mode of the son when he died for us and then the same God expressed himself in the mode of the Holy Spirit in the church age. So that um, what, what you have there is that God is only one person expressing himself in three, you know, three different modes. Now, a contemporary version of modalism is found in the teaching of oneness Pentecostalism. And uh, there was a recent debate between a young fella on, on Facebook and one of the leading exponents of modalistic Pentecostalism. And one of the most well-known, best-selling authors of of our day is a modalistic Pentecostal um, heretic. You deny the deity of Christ, you're, you are a heretic. Okay, so both tritheism and modalism <coughs> both fail to maintain the biblical balance between the one reality of God and his eternal existence in three persons. Now, there is a third error, um, and that's when folks deny the full deity of the Son or, and or the Holy Spirit and um, say that they were um, creations of uh, the Father. And this is precisely what the Jehovah's Witnesses do. This was the um, heresy of a guy named Arius, and uh, back in the... I think he lived 260, somewhere around there. And uh, so his heresy was known as Arianism. It's not the same Arianism that Hitler was into. It's um, the Arianism based on a historical guy named Arius, which is associated with um, the, den the denial of the deity of Christ, which, of course, is... Um, the hallmark of a cult is the, den the denial excuse me, of the Trinity in general and uh, the deity of Christ in particular. And that is a da damning heresy, which means that it would send you to hell. Okay. 
So what are some of the practical implications of the doctrine of the Trinity? The doctrine of the Trinity makes definitive revelation of God possible as he is known in Christ. Quote, no one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. John 1, 18. So, Jesus has re revealed the Father. Two, the Trinity makes the atonement possible. What may have been and was mission impossible for us was mission possible for the Trinity because they conceived of it in eternity past. And it was a Trinitarian um, urgent mission to redeem a people for himself. Redemption of sinful man is accomplished through the distinct and unified activity of each person of the Godhead. Now, quoting from um, Hebrews, note the Trinitarian nature of our salvation. How, quote, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish, to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Hebrews 9, 14. That's lovely, isn't it? Number three, and I really dig this. Because God is triune, he has eternally been personal and relational in his own being. Did you get that? He has eternally been personal and relational in his own being. God is tripersonal. In full independence from his creation, God has never had any unmet needs. Personhood becomes real only within realized relationships. And the reality of relationship can only exist when one has something or someone that is not oneself to relate to. If then God had not been plural in himself, he could not have been a person, excuse me, could not have been a personal, relational God till he had begun creating. And thus, would have been dependent on creation for his own personhood, which is a notion as nonsensical as it is unscriptural. Do you see the reasoning there? Is that for, for those religions like modern Judaism and Islam, God is not really personal because he's strictly monotheistic and he has no one to talk to. Until he makes a creation. So in the very real sense, he had to create in order to be personal. He had to. You can't. The very idea of a person. Personal is, is you communicate. And what I find. Um, so. Wonderful. Is that. We have a tri-personal society at the heart of who God is. That the, the Father communicating with the Son, and the Father communicating with the Holy Spirit, and the Son communicating with the Father, and the Son communicating with the Spirit, and the Spirit communicating with the Father, and the Son communicating with the <coughs> Spirit communicating with the uh, well, and you got the whole dynamic for backwards eternity, to use temporal terms, which again is not a long time, it's eternity. And the eruptions of joy and laughter in the Trinitarian language that I'm sure they share, and the infinite joy uh, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, uh, as perfect, infinite persons 
uh, experience with each other and have forever. It's just amazing to think about the uh, perfect joy and how that cannot but make for the eruptions of um, laughter that would shake the, the cosmos. And uh, to me, it's just lovely to conceptualize and to think about the dynamics of the Trinity, which are alluded to in the high priestly prayer in John 17, the glory which I shared with you in, before the world began. And the, commu the lovely communication between the persons of the Trinity, which is, you know, you had the first person of the Trinity, the second person of the Trinity, and the third person of the Trinity. And uh, let's see, I wanted to read some more from this article uh, here. Um, if God had not been plural in himself, he could not have been a personal relational God till he had begun creating. Okay. Between the persons of the Trinity, there has always existed total relational harmony and expression. God is, from this standpoint, a perfect society in himself. Apart from the plurality in the Trinity, either God's eternal independence of the created order or his eternally relational personal existence would have to be denied. Okay, again, um, you have the, the tri-personal personal society for uh, alluded to, and um, that to me is just a lovely... <laughs> and then lastly, the Trinity provides the ultimate model for relationships within the body of Christ and marriage. 1 Corinthians 11, Ephesians 4. You know, the doctrine of the Trinity is beyond human ability to fully comprehend. It is, uh, has an incomprehensible element about it, for sure. Uh, as much, if not more, than any doctrine in our faith. However, it is central to understanding the nature of God. You know, when I think about the attributes of God, the attributes of God are God. His holiness, He is holy. Uh, love, justice, mercy. But when you think about the Trinity, His being his being is relational. He, he is relationships. You know, he, he is Trinity. It's, um, again, all the attributes are, are who he is. But when you're talking about God is Trinity, that's who we're talking about. His being. His, his very being is tri-personal relationships. <laughs> so, um, it's central to understanding the nature of God and the uh, central events in the history of salvation in which God is seen as acting, in effect, a tri-personal team. Biblical Christianity stands or falls with the doctrine of the Trinity. Amen. Yeah.